Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this virtual launch of the new BSI standard PAS 1899, which is the Electric Vehicle Accessible Charging Specification. My name is Anne Hayes and I head up the sector team at BSI, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all here on a beautiful um, Tuesday morning. This morning, you'll find out more about the new standard, why and how it was developed, and to hear from some of those involved in its development, including the sponsors of the PAS, Motability, the charity, and the UK government's Office for Zero Emission Vehicles. <clears throat> Before we welcome our speakers and run through some housekeeping for the webinar, I want to say a few words on BSI and the role of standards. This is because standards are um, are a different tool for creating change when compared to regulation or the law. However, they do work very effectively alongside. Standardization involves bringing different stakeholders, including in industry, government, consumer bodies, and researchers together to agree what good looks like. Standards can and do therefore go beyond minimum legal requirements where such exist and in setting out good practice. For PAS 1899, this has been about defining what accessible charging is and what it looks like. <clears throat> How we work at BSI and the way that standards are developed is crucial. All of BSI standards are developed through an open consensus-based process and involving all relevant stakeholders with BSI acting as an impartial facilitator. This includes a full public comment stage. We'll hear more about how this worked with PAS 1899 later and from the technical team and members of the expert steering group, group that helped to shape the document. Building consensus as our contributors to PAS 1899 will vouch for can be challenging when developing a standard like this one as we want to create something that is achievable but creates positive change, improves safety and user outcomes. <clears throat> Standards play an important role in improving consumer outcomes, and we hope that this latest work, PAS 1899, will do the same. We believe it will go some way to helping ensure that EV charging across the UK's public network, the physical infrastructure immediately around a charge point, and the experience of using a charge point is accessible for all. We think the standard is the first of its kind globally. This standard can be used um, alongside or in conjunction with another um, with a number of existing standards already in this space, including both those relating to EV charging systems and those covering accessibility, such as BS8300, which deals specifically with inclusive building design. Some of you will be familiar with that particular standard, BS8300, which has helped to raise the bar on inclusion in the built environment sector. It has become widely adopted and aligns to building regulations. So it's something of a benchmark for the industry and is regularly quoted by organizations in design specifications. We hope PAS 1899 can achieve something similar in being recognized, being a recognized benchmark for the design and provision of accessible charging. Something organizations can work to and specify when looking to design, manufacture, install and operate EV charging on the public network. So we're excited to have speakers today from OZEV and Motability, the sponsors of PAS 1899, along with several other members of the steering group that have helped pull the PAS together. This includes the PAS's technical author, Peter from GHD. We're also joined by Catherine and Keir from Designability and Matt Campbell-Hill, who will talk about the importance of end user testing and gaining the perspective from end users. It's really important at this point that I, on behalf of BSI, want to thank all of the team who've been involved in developing the PAS, but also all our speakers today for their time and contribution. We will break into Q&A a little later, so you will have time to put your questions to our speakers. <clears throat> I'm now gonna hand over to BSI's Associate Director for Transport and Mobility, who's going to walk us through the rest of this event and the usual housekeeping for the webinar. So over to Nick. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Anne. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Anne mentioned, my name is Nick Fleming and I head up transport and mobility at BSI and I'll be taking you through the rest of uh, this morning's webinar. I just need to run through a few housekeeping bits in terms of how the webinar will work um, technically before I introduce our first speaker. Um, so, as, as mentioned, this is a listen-only webinar. Um, what that means is you won't be able to turn on your cameras or unmute yourself to talk. You'll only be able to hear from our presenters. 
Um, however, we do want to ensure the event is interactive. And so what you can do is submit any questions you have via the chat function, um, which you'll find in the box on hopefully on the top right of your screen in the sidebar. Um, and you'll be able to click on that um, where the drop down arrow says chat and type type your questions in there. Um, please look out for that for that uh, chat box because what we'll also put in there uh, via the Q and A function is a link to the uh, to the pass, so you'll be able to download it during this session. So please look out for that. We'll post a link in just a, about the time we go into the Q and A. Um, so Anne's already mentioned the Q and A at the end of our speaker sessions. We'll go into a relatively short Q and A session um, where we'll try and pick up as many questions as we can. So simply click on the Q and A button in the side panel and post your question there. If you if you're having any technical problems, again you can post um, any 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 questions into the Q and A, and one of our technical team will try and pick those up. Um, upon completion. Um, of a survey that you'll all be sent, those of you that have registered will be sent a, a survey. Once you've completed that, you, we will be able to send you a link to a recording of the webinar if that is of interest to you. And for those interested in CPD, this is a CPD recognised webinar. So again, you can request a certificate via the feedback survey following the webinar. Okay, so without further ado then, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker this morning and um, that is Seb Allen. Um, Seb is a senior policy advisor in the consumer experience team at OZEV, that's the Office for Zero Emission Vehicles, who as well as sitting on the steering group were one of the sponsors of PAS 1899. Seb is going to put the development of the standard into context for us, into the context of government policy in this area, and talk about some of the initiatives, drivers and, and ambitions for improving public EV charging infrastructure and user experience. Thank you, Seb. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for that uh, great intro there. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about the, uh, the, the context of uh, the work led up to PAS and, and the, the real drivers in the market. So first of all, we're going to cover the, the 2030 phase updates and, and the state of the market. Um, next, we'll move on to the, um, the recently published EV infrastructure strategy, and then the work uh, that is ongoing with improving the consumer experience at public charge points, um, the, the key charging challenges there, and, and uh, the overview of the work that's been, been done there to date. Um, and then we're going to be moving on to the, uh, the kind of the emerging policy areas and, and the next steps for, for government. So, um, in uh, government has, has announced a 10-point plan for a green industrial revolution. Um, in, in that, there are key commitments to um, ending the sale of all new petrol and diesel cars and vans by 2030. Um, and uh, by 2035, all new cars and vans must be zero emissions at the tailpipe. Um, to, to to have a look at the state of the market here, it's, um, it's new data is, is, is quite promising, um, with industry showing that uh, in 2022, one in uh, five new cars sold had a plug, um, with over one million plug-in vehicles um, that have been sold in, in the UK since 2010. And the market um, is, is becoming more affordable for, for zero emissions cars, um, with, with 24 models currently priced under £32,000. In 2021, the, the total public charge points increased by 37%, um, and rapid charge point numbers increased by 33%. On, on average, uh, 600 new charges are being added to the UK's world network each month, which is um, obviously it's good progress. Um, so we have a, an ambitious vision for charge point rollout so that um, everyone can benefit from the transition to, to EVs. Um, we want to see that everyone can find an accessible, reliable uh, public charge point wherever they live. Um, we want to see effortless on and off street charging for private and commercial drivers. Um, we want consumers to have a reliable network of high powered charge points along major roads. Um, we want fairly priced and inclusive signed public charging trusted by consumers. Um, we'd like to see a market-led rollout for the majority of charge points, which is backed by competition, 
um, and uh, an infrastructure that's seamlessly integrated into a, a smart energy system. Um, we also want to see continued innovation to, to meet drivers' needs. Um, and this is laid out in our, our infrastructure uh, policy, uh, taking charge the, the electric infrastructure policy, which we published this year. So there are a number of, of challenges to delivering this vision. Um, the three I've outlined here, uh, you've got the, the consumer experience of public charge points. Um, you know, the charge points can, at, at present can be quite difficult to use for some, for some consumers, um, unreliable in, in places, um, and re require multiple apps and smart, ca smart cards. And um, uh, Improving this consumer experience, improving the confidence in the, the charging network um, is key. Uh, the pace of rollout of, of charging infrastructure is too slow with actually provision of on-street charging for, for people without home charging um, and charging for longer journeys um, Connecting uh, new on route charge points can be slow and costly, uh, and the current the, the motorway service area offer is, is poor. Um, I'm going to be expanding on the consumer experience uh, regulations. So, for, for the consumer experience um, journey that the current EV consumers face, uh, quite a few challenges across the public charging network. Um, location, so they find it difficult to lo locate charge points or they're working um, with many different market participants. Um, uh, it's difficult to find charge points easily when on the move um, uh, with unclear signage or lack of signage um, and uh, uh, lack of planning therefore for, for fleets. Um, parking is confusing with different parking arrangements. Um, people have reported feeling unsafe while charging um, and uh, when, when arriving at a charge point sometimes it's, it's not working. Um, and then it's also uh, confusing with people needing to pay for parking and charging separately. Uh, when actually coming to charge, there are multiple connectors, uh, multiple charge point operators, and, and multiple ways to operate uh, it, these individual charge points, which can be confusing. Um, and then there's different apps for, for that payment for different charge point operators, which can be cumbersome. Um, fleets don't have a, a, a kind of universal fuel card that they can use to pay. Um, and there is a, a confusing landscape um, with uh, some charge points with contactless installed, some free charging and unclear instructions. So, um, what, what's the work that's been done today? So, we uh, we consulted on improving the consumer experience of public charge points, including payment, reliability, pricing transparency, and opening up data. Um, we a uh, government response to pub, uh, published the response to this in March this year, um, with uh, regulations to be laid in, in the coming months. Um, we also uh, consulted on wider powers to ensure future proofing for consumer protections and accessible, inclusive charge point design. Um, that was the Future of Transport Regulatory Review, um, and the government response uh, is to be published uh, this year. Um, the Charge Point Design Project, uh, which was unveiled at COP26, um, designed with, with inclusivity and, and ease of use in mind, um, and obviously the, the development of, uh, of the PAS uh, 1899 with um, BSI, uh, Accessible Charging Standards, in, in partnership with, um, with Motability. Um, so uh, the consumer experience. Um, uh, outcomes. So we have proposed intervening in four key areas. Um, so uh, uh, single payment met uh, single payment met metrics. So people, the customers can consume uh, consumers can compare the price across different charging networks. Um, a reliability metric. So we can improve the reliability of charge points. Um, a uh, opening data. So consumers can um, easily locate the right charge points um, and standardising the payment methods um, so that. Um, consumers uh, have a consistent experience across um, across charge points. So emerging policy areas. So where are we going from from now? Um, so we are exploring action in in, in further action in, in public areas. So consumer protections for electric vehicle charging. Uh, we're gathering evidence gathering evidence on existing and emerging potential areas of harm. Um, and we've consulted on taking new primary powers to, to mandate minimum consumer protections. Um, and with uh, the inclusive charge point design work um, with, with ESI and, and Motability, um, uh, we, uh, we will monitor the, the uptake of PAS 1899 and the scale of uptake um, in order to inform whether um, regulations in this area are, are needed in the future. And, uh, and that's it for me. Um, I'll, I'll pass back to Nick. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you, Seb.
That was great. Thank you. And um, yeah, it was a really helpful summary of, I guess, a number of uh, policy drivers and interventions that, that, that are looking to help improve and increase the UK's charging infrastructure. So I'm sure they're going, they're, there'll be more questions on that in the Q&A. Our next speaker who I can see has joined us is Catherine Maris, Head of Innovation at Motability, the National Disability Charity. So Mo Motability were a co-sponsor of the PAS, but also a key part of, of the steering group that developed the standard. Catherine leads on research into transport accessibility, some of which has been fundamental to the development of this standard. So we're going to hear from Catherine now on the background to the standard, why this issue is so important and, and why a standard is needed. Um, over to you, Catherine. Thanks so much, Nick. If we could just move to the next slide. Um, so just trying to kind of cover the high level issue, which is why do we think um, as a national disability charity that public charging in particular uh, needs to be accessible? So we know that one in five people um, in the UK um, report disability. Um, so this isn't kind of a small part of the population. It's a lot of people, an important consumer group that we need to think about. Um, we also carried out some research with Ricardo Consulting that estimated by 2035, there will be 2.7 million um, disabled drivers or passengers in the UK and because of their particular home parking situation half of those people so again nearly 1.4 million people um, are going to be reliant on public charging they won't be able to charge um, at home um, we also know that retrofitting can be really expensive and um, as industry kind of catches up and, and realizes they need to, to cater to this group of consumers, we might end up um, with a lot of very expensive retrofitting if we don't um, design inclusively and accessibly from the start. We also know that um, uh, charging is going to kind of change the way we refuel and um, we might be um, kind of recharging on on street um, in off street public charging infrastructure like um, at a Tesco um, car park. We might be charging at um, a rapid um, charging hub. Um, there's many different environments in which people are going to refuel. It's not going to be the same kind of standard environment as a petrol station. And each of those environments have kind of different implications for accessibility. Um, so we thought, you know, kind of thinking about accessibility in the public charging context was really important. Um, we also think it's actually quite exciting. There's an opportunity here to really design inclusively um, for, for kind of years to come. Um, a lot of our existing transport infrastructure is very old and kind of um, hasn't changed as much um, since it's been put into place. Whereas here we have a whole new set of infrastructure that's going to be deployed. We really have this opportunity to get it right um, and make things much more inclusive and accessible for everyone. And I think Finally, um, and, and importantly, um, let's not forget this, it's the right thing to do. We all want infrastructure to be accessible and inclusive. We can move to the next slide. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what some of the key public charging challenges are, if this is an issue you haven't um, come across before. Um, and I want to split these kind of into the charge point itself um, and then the built environment. Um, so in our research with disabled people um, that we've carried out with Designability, an another disability charity that you're going to hear from later, um, we've discovered that um, uh, people kind of, uh, you know, have have um, issues with the height of the charge point. Um, so charge points sometimes are, are too tall or they're too low, um, whether you're a seated user or you're using mobility aid. Um, we've also seen charge points where there isn't enough space um, around them. So they're kind of um, uh, implemented um, too close maybe to the edge of the curb or part of the bay. And so it's difficult to get around them and access them. And um, we've seen charge points that have bollards that aren't adequately spaced. So again, if you're using mobility aid, um, you wouldn't be able to access the, the charge point itself. Um, we've seen a lot of interfaces that don't have kind of clear and consistent language. Um, so again, um, could be difficult to understand. A big one that people talk about all the time, and I know there's there's a lot of conversation around this, is heavy cables. Um, and again, um, you know, uh, uh, it's it's very difficult um, to lift. Um, there is also a lack of cable management systems. Um, so um, we see that a lot of times, um, you know, cables being kind of curled in the wrong way, or people are tripping over them, which again can be really dangerous and not good from an accessibility perspective. And we've also seen connectors that require a huge amount of kind of force to attach, um, or, or, or are just a little bit difficult um, uh, to get into place. Um, the built environment, and um, we've seen kind of lack of signage or clear, um, again, clear and consistent language about where exactly um, a charger is located um, within um, a particular location and how to use it. Um, we've seen kind of um, really high curbs, 
um, uh, again, um, that, that aren't accessible. We see not enough space around the vehicle. And then um, kind of as, as this photo would show, um, really poor placement of the charge point relative to the curb um, or the bay. Generally, we've also seen a lot of charge points that have been uncovered um, in dark, far away areas of car parks. There's not any CCTV or lighting, so they don't really make people feel safe um, or that it's accessible and inclusive. And again, when I talk about these changes, it may sound like a lot, a lot of issues to try and solve. But actually, if you think about some of these from the start, a lot of the changes are small and practical and can be designed in from the very beginning. And I think more importantly, they'd improve the experience for all users, um, for disabled people, but also um, for anyone else. Again, um, if you're if you're trying to use um, a, a charge point where it requires um, two hands to kind of lift the socket and then plug in the cable, the socket cover and then plug in the cable, um, if you're kind of carrying a child at the same time or you're carrying your shopping um, and you can't do it with one hand, um, you know, that's also going to make it really inaccessible for you. So again, it's it's not just about disability, it's about making this more accessible and inclusive for everyone. We can move to the next slide. Um, so what is some of the work that's happened to date? So Seb, I've um, already talked about um, some of the work that's been going on in government um, to really look at the consumer experience um, generally and accessibility within that. Um, so I won't go into to that again, um, but we've also been doing a lot of work as a charity um, with designability on um, engaging disabled people, meeting them all over the country and um, having them test out different kinds of charging infrastructures. We really wanted that solid research foundation um, for the PAS, so we understood what people's requirements were and how to feed them into the standard. The Research Institute for Disabled Consumers has also done some fantastic research in this space. Um, and as, as Motability, we've tried to engage a lot of stakeholders in this to raise awareness. So we've done workshops with disability charities and disabled people's organizations. And again, we've met a lot with industry and industry bodies um, as well, so that they're aware of what's coming and they've had an opportunity um, to feed in. Um, designability, we'll talk about this later, but there's also been some works on um, accessible charging prototypes and a design guide, um, which we think will be really impactful. And we've had the opportunity as well to collaborate, for example, with ZapMap on their annual survey, and they, they included some questions around accessibility Accessibility. With UK Power Networks on the Enable project, where we looked at the role of um, distribution network operators, how they can get involved in, in promoting accessible charging. Um, Transport Scotland um, uh, did kind of a, um, a series of challenge funding, um, and some of them focused, some of the projects focused on accessibility. Um, uh, there's some great work that Urban Foresight has done in this space as well. Um, Energy Savings Trust has, has done a lot of research in this space. So again, it feels like there's this conversation beginning and there's a lot of resources out there that would really encourage people to, to look into and that have been fed into this standard. Next slide, please. So uh, I just wanted to, to talk a little bit about why we um, as a disability charity felt that standards are important. Um, we know that um, kind of good standards go hand in hand with the consumer experience. Um, it makes sure that we agree um, a good practice and that can improve outcomes for people. And what we're really excited about PAS 1899, so we think it's kind of the, the first national accessible charging standard that's been put out there that has a minimum specification across all charging infrastructure. Um, we did this in partnership with the Office for Zero Emissions Vehicles. Um, and I think it's, it's just this really exciting opportunity for the UK to be a leader in accessibility and inclusion. Um, again, um, it, it kind of sets out requirements for accessibility across all charge points. So I spoke before about the different environments. It addresses all of them, um, which is which is really great. It means all public charging infrastructure can become more accessible. And there are also informative annexes um, for best practice that can go um, even further. Um, uh, Peter Weldon, the author for the standard, is going to talk a little bit more about what's in scope. But again, it's really about public charging, the charge point itself and the built -in environment. I and mean, there's a bit around signage and information. But what it really does is it helps define what accessibility means, what do we define as accessible charging, and how can it be achieved? Um, I'm also really excited about the fact it was developed through consensus. Um, so again, um, there are a lot of stakeholders that were part of this process, um, whether it's disabled people or disabled people's organizations, um, but also industry and industry bodies and charge point providers who kind of said, you know, this is what I think is achievable. Um, and that was, there was that really productive um, back and forth. What I would say is we would um, encourage um, anyone working in industry to continue to test with users as much as this is a specification. I think there's even more we can do to, to keep understanding um, people's experiences and improving infrastructure as a result. So I'd say we would continue to push for that user testing. Next slide. 
Yeah, and that's just it for me. Um, again, um, please feel free to reach out. My email is there in case you have any questions. Um, but we're very excited about um, the launch of PAS 1899, and, and we hope, hope it can really improve outcomes across. Brilliant. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, as you said, uh, we, we, you know, hopefully this standard and the work around it is the start of something here. And, and you've highlighted a number of the, the topics considered during the development of the PAS and also um, I guess a few of those different voices that were around the table helping to build consensus. Um, a PAS is a, is a type of BSI standard that involves bringing together a steering group of stakeholders to develop good practice, often in fast-moving areas or areas of emerging technologies. Um, for each BSI PAS, uh, we work with a technical author and the technical author works with BSI and steering group to help with the drafting of the standard and with the process of building consensus on some of the key aspects of the document. Um, and so I'm pleased now to hand over to Peter Weldon of GHD. Peter was the technical author on PAS 1899, and he, he's going to talk a little bit more about the process of developing the standard and how that worked, who was involved on the steering group, um, what is covered by the standard, and critically, what, what is not covered. Um, and also, importantly, explain a bit more about the intended audience for the standard, who, who responsibility for adopting the standard may sit with. So there's a lot for you to cover there, Peter. So uh, over to you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Nick. Hello, everyone, and good morning. My name is Peter Weldon. I'm a Transport Decarbonisation Lead Specialist in the Professional Services and Engineering Consultancy, GHD. And as Nick mentioned, I'm also the technical author for PAS 1899. So I'm here to introduce the standard, to introduce its structure, uh, what it covers and the overall process for uh, developing the PAS. Next slide, please. So just to begin by uh, giving an overview of the process of developing PAS 1899. So the development of PAS 1899 followed standardized BSI PAS processes, where there is an overall process that we follow to develop any PAS. Every PAS has a steering group of industry members. So our uh, steering group consisted of national government departments from each developed nation, accessibility experts, charge point operators, distribution network operators, representative organizations for renewable energy and for electric vehicles, consultancies, electric vehicle services stakeholders, and consumer networks. There is an iterative drafting process for, of any PAS and for PAS 1899, which took place over the course of the year. And each uh, phase ends with a draft and it culminates with a steering group meeting to resolve any comments on each specific draft. And there's also a public consultation period to allow any interested party and any member, member of the public to submit comments on the PAS. The content of the PAS. So it is based on the best available evidence at this time. In terms of my role as a All right, next slide, please. Peter, I think uh, we were losing you there. Um, okay, can, no, you, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. can do you, do you, are you able just to go back to your last slide, Peter? Because I think we, we may have lost you on the on the previous slide. If we could yeah, move no that, that would be great. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, no problem. And thanks for bearing with us. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, I'll just go back to the process of developing the PAS. So as with all PASs, there is an iterative drafting process where there are different phases of the PAS that take place over the course of the year that each uh, culminate with the development of a draft. And there are steering group meetings to resolve comments and to discuss the draft. And then there is a public consultation period to allow any interested party and any member of the public to comment on the PAS. The content of the PAS itself is informed by existing research, new research, and existing standards focused on both charge points and accessibility. So it is focused on the best available evidence at this time. And in terms of my role as a technical author, it is to write the standard and to bring together all of the evidence and research feeding into the standard and to resolve any issues or conflicts to come to a consensus, factoring in expert experience and opinion from the steering group and from the wider public. Next slide, please.
So just to discuss and give an outline of the structure of PAS 1899. So first and foremost, the PAS is applicable to all public charge points as defined in the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Regulations 2017 definition. It is important to note that while some charge points may fall outside this definition and that private charge points aren't explicitly included, the learnings from the PAS and the requirements within the PAS can nevertheless be used for other types of charge points to factor in accessibility to the installation of those charge points. The PAS itself has a dual purpose, the first of which is to provide a core standard for all public charge points defining minimum requirements for accessibility, so for all public charge points. And then the second purpose is to provide best practice guidance for charge points specifically installed adjacent to accessible parking bays. So in terms of the first purpose that's represented on the diagram on the left hand side of the page, where the five main clauses of the diagram are focused on the core standard for minimum requirements for accessibility for all public charge points. This is followed by an annex looking at supplementary best practice accessibility guidance for all public charge points. And then there are two separate annexes focused on best practice accessibility guidance for charge points installed adjacent to designated accessible parking bays. So it does cover those two or those uh, dual elements. Some clauses within the PAS are only relevant to some types of charge points. So for example, on-street and off-street charge points might have slightly different requirements. So a scenario system has been incorporated in the PAS to distinguish between charge point types. Where we've come up with four different scenarios, which are off-street low-powered, off-street high-powered, on-street low-powered, and off-street high-powered, where some clauses are only relevant to some specific scenarios of charge points. And then finally, wireless charge points are covered separately within the PAS as they have slightly different accessibility requirements, as they don't require a cable in order to maneuver or operate the charge point. Next slide, please. So in terms of the onus of responsibility for implementing PAS 1899, so as everyone on this webinar is probably aware, the public charge point landscape is inherently complicated and involves many different bodies to install public charge points. However, for any PAS, the ultimate onus of responsibility needs to be on a single body. So for PAS 1899, the ultimate onus of responsibility is on the procurer of public charge points, but the procurer of public charge points can comprise different types of bodies. So looking at the uh, left-hand side diagram, the procurer of public charge points is at the top of the diagram, and this can comprise, for example, charge point operators, service providers, local authorities, car park owners, landowners or landlords, or leaseholders. So there are multiple different types of bodies that can be a procurer of public charge points. For each stage of charge point installation, there are interactions with other bodies. So looking at the four main clauses here, the responsibility of the procurer of public charge points, is, points can be seen at the top of each box, but then the possible additional bodies involved are uh, within the bottom box within this diagram. So it just shows that the installation of public charge points is a collaborative environment whilst the ultimate onus of responsibility is on a single body. As with all PASs, the implementation of uh, PAS 1899, it's voluntary and implementation. Government is committed to monitoring uptake and Motability is actively exploring ways to support uptake of the PAS. And then in terms of the design of the PAS, uh, the design has been undertaken with concentric design to aid with following the requirements and there have been checklists uh, provided to assist with tracking the requirements. So this is represented on the diagram in the bottom left, where the physical charge point design is in the center, followed by charge point placement, then streetscape and public realm around the charge point, and finally digital platforms and information provision for charge points. Next slide, please. So I'll just now give an overview about what aspects are covered within each clause. So clause five is focused on physical charge point design and the aspects covered in clause five include charge point component heights, charge point cables, so weight, length and grip, charge point connections and charge point screens and visual interfaces. When we refer to cable weights, it's important to note that charging cable weights were informed by novel new research undertaken by Designability that is focused on force in hand measurements in order to operate cables. It was found throughout the course of developing the PAS that specifying, for instance, a maximum cable weight or maximum weight per meter is infeasible as there are different cables available on the market. So the charging weight uh, clause is addressed by looking at force and hand measure measurements required to operate charging cables. Clause six is focused on charge point placement. Uh, the aspects covered in clause six include charge point orientation and access to charge point components and spacing around the charge point, ground surface type below and around charge points, the reach distance to charge point components and low level obstacles and bollards and impact protection barriers surrounding charge points. 
Next slide, please. Clause seven is focused on streetscape and public realm around charge points. So the aspects covered in clause seven include street furniture in the vicinity of public charge points, level access points and drop curbs and proximity to charge points of dropped curbs, distances between public charge points and amenities or a venue, and the provision of additional assistance for charge points. And then finally, clause eight is focused on digital platforms and information provision for charge points. So the aspects covered in clause eight include remote digital platforms for public charge points and ensuring that these are designed with accessibility and then information provision for charge points, particularly for accessibility related data. For clause eight, it is important to note that there is a strong interaction with forthcoming consumer experience regulations. As mentioned in Sam's presentation, the consumer experience regulations are expected to cover minimum payment method, payment roaming, open data, pricing transparency and reliability. And whilst all of these aspects are very important to accessibility and have been found to be very important throughout the research undertaken for the PAS, the regulations nevertheless need to be followed in any case. So as such, the PAS doesn't duplicate the requirements. It references out the regulations and informs readers that these regulations must be followed in addition to the PAS. Next slide, please. Then to focus on Annex B and C, these are focused on designated accessible parking bays for off-street and on-street charge points respectively. So charge points installed specifically adjacent to accessible parking bays can benefit from additional accessibility considerations tailored to the users of the charge points. So Annex B and Annex C cover guidance for charge points installed specifically adjacent to designated accessible parking bays for off-street and on-street charge points respectively. Aspects considered in both of these annexes include additional space allowance surrounding parking bays and surrounding charge points, the surface gradient at charge points, reach distance of reducing that reach distance to public charge point components, the distance from designated accessible parking bays to amenities, overhead protection at charge points, and signage and road markings for designated accessible parking bays. For these annexes, all other clauses must be followed, so clauses four to eight, in addition to recommended or recommended following this best practice guidance. Next slide, please. And then just to discuss the additional annexes that are included within PAS 1899, the first of which is focused on establishing an inclusive and safe environment around public charge points. So this is additional good practice considerations for an inclusive environment some of these may be considered outside the direct responsibility of the procurer of public charge points, but they are nevertheless recommended to implement for good practice considerations to establish that inclusive environment. This annex includes uh, guidance around lighting around public charge points, provision of security cameras, signage provision, and charging process signals to let you know uh, when each phase of the charging process begins and ends. Annex D covers wireless and inductive charge points. So wireless and inductive charge points may have particular benefits for disabled users as there are no cables to maneuver. But as such, Annex D provides guidance on how to interpret the requirements of PAS 1899 in the context of wireless and inductive charge points. As I mentioned, some uh, clauses aren't going to be relevant for wireless charge points. So this Annex provides that uh, guidance on how to interpret the PAS. Annex E provides checklists for requirements and good practice guidance for accessible public charge points. The checklists of requirements and good practice guidance have been provided to aid with following the PAS, where each clause and each element of good practice guidance has a checklist that can be ticked off. And then there are separate checklists for the core standard and the guidance for designated accessible parking bays. And then finally, Annex F is focused on determining forces required for charging cable maneuverability. So clause 5.3.2, focus on cable weight, is based on not only research undertaken by designability, that is focused on forces required for charging cable maneuverability. So Annex F outlines the findings from this research along with the testing methods in order to comply with the clause. Next slide, please. So in terms of next steps in taking PAS 1899 forward, PAS 1899 represents a benchmark of what can be reasonably expected for the provision of accessible public charge points based on best available information and best available evidence. Implementing the requirements within PAS 1899 involves a collaborative approach to cover all aspects relevant to the accessibility of public charge points, and PAS 1899 represents a key step towards improving the accessibility of public charge points, and government and mobility are exploring ways to engage with industry to further develop the PAS in the future. Next slide, please. I'd like to thank you all for listening to my presentation. I hope you found it informative and hopefully not too many sound issues. 
Uh, I've provided my contact details here in case anyone has any questions on anything that I've presented. Uh, thank you all very much. Thanks, you, thanks, Peter. No, we, we, I think we, we got you back technically, so that was great. Thanks for bearing with us. Um, it was really helpful overview uh, by Peter of the structure of the standard and the various inputs that fed into it. Um, and as Peter said, you know, it's the, the process itself um, allowed us to incorporate new thinking as we went um, and new research and novel research, which I think shows the, the kind of agility of the process uh, to an extent. Um, so supporting industry and inspiring organisations in terms of how they might implement the standard um, is obviously going to be really important to help it deliver on its ultimate aims and ambitions and, and, and bring it to life. So uh, to help us do that, our next speakers are Designability, a national charity which enables disabled people to live with greater independence and Designability help by creating products, but also advising other organisations on how to make their products more accessible. So I'm really pleased now to introduce Catherine Brown, Chief Executive at Designability, and Keir Haynes. Keir leads on research and product design. And we're going to hear a bit more from Catherine and Keir on putting the standard into practice and more on user testing and engagement. Thank you, Catherine and Keir. Thanks, Nick. Um, so, uh... As uh, Nick said, uh, our role has been to help put the standard into practice. Uh, so I'm just going to bring up the next slide. My apologies, I'm having difficulty taking control of the slide, so I wonder um, if the webinar team could assist me, please. Uh, thank you very much. So Designability are a national charity uh, and we've worked with disabled people for over 50 years, listening to uh, and understanding their lived experience of disability. Uh, in that time, we've designed over 300 products ourselves uh, to help disabled people to live with greater independence. And we've also worked with a wide variety of other companies and organizations to help them make their products more accessible to disabled people. Um, we do that using the principles of human-centered design uh, and as well as design skills, uh, the most important thing about human-centered design is that you listen to the humans in order to make sure that your design solutions are the most effective. So our key role has been to work with Motability, the charity you heard from Catherine earlier on, on research and engagement with hundreds of disabled people to inform a newly created piece of design guidance, which we'll tell you a bit more about in a moment. Um, so listening to disabled people has been at the absolute heart of our work in this project. Uh, and we've also been an expert contributor to the steering group uh, uh, for BSI in creating this standard. Next slide, please. So we, from the research that you've already heard, uh, we know that there are nearly 1.4 million disabled drivers who are going to find it difficult to charge their electric vehicles in the public uh, sphere. Uh, and that's over half of disabled drivers who are going to be reliant on public charging points uh, uh, in the future. And the research showed how inaccessible they are to disabled people currently. And with over one in five people in the UK being disabled, we knew we had to act. We were shocked to hear from disabled people how difficult they found uh, using public charge points. And we believe strongly that no one should be left behind in the transition to electric vehicles. And uh, as the uh, quote here says, uh, something that's inaccessible to disabled people is usually quite challenging for non-disabled people. Um, we all have experiences in our lives when we are disabled to one extent or another, uh, whether we have a broken leg or a young baby on our hip, which means we only have uh, one arm available to use. Uh, so it's, it has broader accessibility connotations than purely disabled people, but that's been our specific focus in this project. Next slide, please. 
So our role is to make the complex, and it is complex, you've heard quite a lot of complex information so far on this webinar, our role is to make that complex information simple. So we've produced design guidance, which draws together all the detailed evidence to inspire you to make public charging more accessible and convenient for disabled people and indeed for everyone. So this design guidance is aimed at helping anyone who is responsible for planning, procuring, designing, or making and installing public EV charge points more accessible. Uh, we heard from Seb at Ozev earlier on uh, that the UK has around 10% of the public charge points that it's going to need by 2030 in order to make this EV transition available to everyone. So we know the time is now uh, to avoid expensive retrofitting and this design guidance shows you how. So I'm now going to pass over to Kia, who's the senior product designer at Designability, who has led this project for us. Thanks, Kia. Thanks, Catherine, and good morning, everybody. So yeah, I'm going to tell you about the project we've been doing, which is run alongside uh, the development of the PAS. So we began this in the spring last year. Uh, it's a bit about what we've done, who we've worked with, um, how that supported us as a steering group member, um, and the output of that work in terms of the design guidance. So we've conducted a practical research and design activities directly with um, a number of disabled drivers and passengers and people close to them. First of all, to understand how charging infrastructure is failing disabled people. And we've heard about that already from other speakers. And then to explore with them um, what accessible design solutions might look like so actually designing and developing some prototypes um, this this experience has been really valuable for us as steering group member um, to feedback live as the standard has been developed um, but we also see um, it, it, it at the start um, of new accessible design solutions going forward we work with a range of different people with all sorts of needs um, most people with issues of mobility, but also strength, dexterity, stamina, um, and those are people that can only use one limb, so um, have to operate things with a single hand. Um, we've worked with both seated and standing users, and that's really important. Um, I think sometimes with accessibility, um, people think about wheelchairs, they think about space, they think about being seated using a product, and the obvious challenges that that poses. Um, but we've also engaged with people that use walking sticks and crutches um, to support them in moving around and um, walking frames and also prostheses and also and also those people with no mobility aids that may experience pain and discomfort, may not be able to bend down and so have access um, needs. Um, and it's worth noting that we've worked with people that have electric cars at the moment, but also people who've never charged an electric vehicle before. Um, and as Catherine mentioned, at Designability, we practice a human-centered design approach. And what that's meant on this project from the very beginning, what we call a discovery phase, when we're understanding about the users and their needs, um, we're understanding about EV charging, the types of vehicles that people use, um, right the way through to getting feedback on designs, um, user testing in order to, to validate ideas and find out if they're, um, they're meeting the needs and the requirements. Um, is to place users, people at the centre of that process. Predominantly on this project, that's been disabled people themselves, but we've also engaged with industry stakeholders, so manufacturers, charge point operators, to understand um, their needs as well, so that not only do these do these solutions meet the needs of people, but they also meet the needs of, of kind of business um, and the kind of um, commercial aspects of bringing these these products and solutions to market. Um, so I'm going to tell you about the design guidance, um, which is um, being published today as well. Um, this is very much um, complementary to um, PAS 1899. Um, we want to support industry to achieve the requirements of the standard um, and see that this design guidance is one way of, uh, um, of, of doing that. We want to demonstrate how accessibility needs can be met and share why it's important. So not only do we um, provide it, um, provide examples, but we also, um, you know, build on the evidence and the research from engaging with people about why it's important. Um, and that's key because solutions now may be different to solutions in the future, but people's needs remain the same. So 
um, it, it, understanding how to, how to achieve and what to achieve, but also why is really important. So we're publishing an online design resource um, and then coming soon also, we're looking to um, disseminate this as well through a design book, which will be downloadable. So what's in the guidance then? We've got some background in terms of the basics, so people can come to this for the first time. It's a one-stop shop um, for understanding about EVs, the type of adaptations disabled people may have to their vehicles and the type of mobility aids that they use. Um, we've given some background on the scope and approach, so um, a focus on public charging here, um, how to use the guidance and who it's for. Catherine's um, mentioned some of the audiences that we're, we're targeting this at. Um, and we've also built in some case studies. So those have been inspired by the almost 200 people that we've worked with on this project. Um, they're not um, real, they are, they're, they're fictional, but they've been drawn from a, a number of people. Um, and those help to illustrate um, the kind of access needs that people have and how um, accessible design solutions can really have an impact on their charging experience. The core of the guidance, um, Similar to the PAS, focuses on three key areas, information and signage, um, the built environment, and the work that we've done, um, the area we've done most work in, um, charging an electric vehicle itself, and the components and the products associated with that. Um, throughout the guidance, we've provided links to the, um, the PAS, where obviously more, uh, more detail and specific requirements um, are needed. Um, and we've also provided a section, which we call our, our design examples, where you can see firsthand um, the, the, the prototypes and the products that we've developed. Um, it's worth noting that Designability are not going to commercialize these. Um, these are very much um, designed um, and intended as inspiration. Um, we'd be happy to talk to industry about the work we've done in developing those. Um, and if you'd like an opportunity to come and see those firsthand, um, we'll be um, at the London EV show um, at the end of November and beginning of December. So yeah, these design examples are very much um, intended to provide industry um, with examples of what accessible charging products could look like. Um, through that human-centered design approach, we've tested and validated um, these designs directly with disabled people with a range of different needs. Um, we developed two prototypes, um, one um, looking at the components of fast charging, um, and another looking at um, rapid charging, so where you have the cable attached to the unit. Um, just to give you a, um, a brief sense of um, what those design examples demonstrate, um, we've got some um, illustrations here, some photographs um, of, of the prototypes and people using them. Um, so on the, on the fast charging unit, we've looked at um, the position of key features on the charging unit, for example, the socket, height, so that it can be used by people that are both seated and standing. Um, we've looked at the connector design itself um, and supporting people with various different grips, so looking at um, adding an additional handle. Um, on the rapid charging unit, we have again looked at the connector itself in order to provide um, the ability for people to grip that in, in different ways. So we've got this kind of hoop design you can see on the top right, um, and that allows people to hold it with more than one hand, um, perhaps even pass their arm through it. Um, so it gives flexibility for people with a range of different strength and dexterity. Um, we've explored um, cable management and support of the cable to take the weight close to the charging unit um, from an overhead arm, and also um, looked at how the flexibility of the cable close to the connector uh, could be improved um, because at the, at the moment uh, as, as, as others have highlighted that cable is very stiff so not only does that make it heavy but when you have to man, uh, manipulate and maneuver that in a tight space um, it's really quite difficult especially for those with um, limited strength and dexterity so how can we um, perhaps introduce some flexibility into the cable um, in certain areas um, support for walking aids and then on the fast charging unit, we've also got many um, a number of examples of um, how you might have a socket cover that is able to be operated um, with just a single hand. Um, so just give you a flavour of those design examples. And as I say, you'll find those on the design guidance website. So just to finish up then, um, we're really encouraged by the engagement um, with the PAS um, and, and the work we've been doing um, from industry, 
both um, of representatives on the steering group, but also through the public consultation. Um, that's not always the case on um, projects to do with accessibility. So yeah, we're, we're really encouraged by that. Um, we see the, the PAS and, and the, the guidance we're issuing as the beginning of a shift towards accessible charging solutions for all. Um, but we want to continue to collaborate, work together with industry to ensure that implementation um, and that impact for disabled people um, is achieved. And we see the work that we've done and the design guidance, um, hopefully um, it's um, in uh, supporting that vision. Um, that's it from me and I'll hand back now to Nick. Thank you. Thanks, Keir and, and Catherine. That was incredibly helpful. Uh, and as you say, um, it's great to see what an accessible charge point that meets the standard might look like and it really helps to, to bring it to life. So that's that's fantastic. C Catherine and Keir have eloquently highlighted the importance of considering end user requirements uh, when designing products and also why accessibility must be front of mind when designing new products and services and looking at all products and services. Our final speaker today before we break into Q&A is Matt Campbell-Hill. Matt represented end users on the past steering group as a representative of EVA England. Matt is a consultant in emerging and novel technologies, mainly in highly regulated areas, um, with the majority of his focus on medical technologies and transport. He holds several non-executive directorships, including for the DVSA, and is an expert advisor to CCAV, um, looking at the connected and automated vehicles and safety assurance there. So Matt's going to just talk a little bit more about his experience on the past steering group and, and why the end user point of view is such an important one. Matt, over to you. Thank you, Nick. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, and um, I'm gonna try and give you a bit of a break from slides. It's uh, very easy just to get stuck in slide after slide after slide. So uh, I, I uh, thought we'd have a little bit of a break, give you some time to, to think about what your questions are gonna be. Um, what we all do know, especially I'm, I'm sure everyone that's here today, is it really is a great time to be driving an electric vehicle. Right? It, it's probably, uh, there hasn't been an easier time to get a, an electric vehicle, to get someone to be into one that's actually usable and you can do proper journeys with it. Uh, with it. And with more and more models becoming available and the prices dropping all the time, uh, it's even easier for us to, if we're, or if we like, if you're like me and you've already got an EV, you've been a relatively early adopter, it's easier to get your friends to be thinking about doing the same. And um, as a wheelchair user, I've had a lot of great experiences with my EV and how we can, uh, how I'm able to ensure that my friends, that my when I was a, a wheelchair athlete, my teammates and those that I meet around them, their, their family, their friends, their carers, how are they all going to be able to have that sort of experience? And when EVA England was formed in um, 2020, it was because there was a small group of passionate EV users, just like me. They were, they found the idea of this, um, uh, the, the new EVs that were much more usable, not just that 30 mile range, but good few hundred miles, really, really fitted in with what they wanted from life and what they want to be able to do with their, with their journeys and how they could essentially be giving back to their, to their future communities. Um, and they looked around and they saw what are the issues out there and how can we improve it? And they, they saw there were models out there um, in Scotland, Netherlands, Norway, and the USA of, of this, these groups so called EVA. So that's why we have EVA England and, um, and that common theme that all of these organizations were noticing is charging infrastructure. And there's lots of different issues in charging infrastructure, but another one that came, for, came forward is if you are disabled, that is even more lacking. So of course, how does design improve life for, the, for those with a disability? And, and why should we focus on such a small percentage of people? Well, improving accessibility doesn't just improve it for the disabled. We heard that a little bit earlier. Well, what does that look like? Um, I'm sure many of you have been to London and maybe many of you remember London in the 80s and, and 90s. 
the old buses, the route master buses, there's still a few of those around. And I talk about this um, every now and then when I um, talk about accessibility and design. We still see them. Now, even if you're able-bodied, I haven't always been in a wheelchair. I'm, I'm six foot five. Um, so when I was standing, I was quite fit. They're still pretty steep step getting into a, a route master bus. So if you're, even if you're completely able-bodied, they're not the easiest things to get into. But if you're carrying shopping, it's even a bit more of an issue. If you've got kids with you, if you are a little bit older, if you're just it's a bit cold and you're in that old knees just feeling a bit meh, you're not really disabled, you don't think of yourself as disabled. But is that Route Master bus as easy to get into and as easy to use as one of the modern buses that comes up right up to the curb and drops? No, it's not. That new bus is far easier for everyone to use. And that's a really important thing about accessibility. Um, and the first thing we notice with, with modern cars is the size of modern cars. And we've got a very standard uh, parking space, the, the, the minimum required parking space in, in the UK and around lots of Europe. It doesn't really fit. We're getting quite tight opening. Who, who's who's got driven into a supermarket and suddenly found actually if I park in there, that's I can fit my car in there, but I probably can't get out or a bit worried that them trying to get into their car. So these are all sort of little issues that we start to pick up when we start to think about how we design it and how do we engage with the public? Because actually the public are really important on design. So when EVA approached me to help as part of the, the steering group for PAS. It had been following their early conversations with Motability and, and Catherine, who I had the privilege of working with Catherine before, because they really wanted to understand what the issues were going to be as we go ahead, as we get more and more drivers. And importantly, to focus on how we can get the most people involved in making sure that future charging infrastructure meets the needs of everyone. And personally, having worked closely with Mobility Charities for years, as, as well as my own experience traveling for work and traveling as an athlete and um, uh, all over the world, it's all too clear how much of a difference there is in an interpretation of accessibility. So finding a standard that suits everyone is rarely possible, but we also have to do that. We have to give it a go by using as many people. So we've just heard as well from, from Kira and from um, Catherine about that idea of, how do we use human-centered design approach? So you don't get stuck in that, in that silo of thinking, well, I'm designing this, we've got a small team of designers here, we're gonna make something that, that's just gonna deal with us. Because we see that a lot, we still see it today. I know that many of my female friends who have their mobile phones, they cannot hold their mobile phone with one hand and text. They can't do it, it's too big. Again, I said I'm six or five, you can see how smashed my phone is. That's what happens when you have kids around. Um, but I can just about do it. And that's using these one of these buttons. Um, then uh, other, other examples we've had on that, um, where uh, it, until recently, design was so siloed and so silo focused was um, skin tone clothing, where really it was skin tone clothing if you were very either light skin light skinned and slightly pink really now it's much better now people have gone out and go said to the who are the users say okay what does skin tone mean for you what is a good use for, for a mobile phone for you hence we've got the flip phones coming back so <clears throat> as a as a um someone coming in from the outside what does it feel like well part of it is to make sure that we could help eva leverage their members and EVA actually didn't just work with their members they worked went outside that and they looked to, to connect with the other groups and I know we connected with um, a couple of other um, EV drive, driving groups to canvas their requests their thoughts their experiences and of course when we had questions from the past going out there what do you think of this what's missing Using Fora in this way is not perfect, um, and, and probably the single biggest problem that we had, and I think is the same that they have in, in many standards, is people coming back with issues that don't tie in with actually what you're asking. But that's really helpful in itself, because it says to us, yes, you're interested. You're interested in this whole thing, so stay interested. Importantly, stay interested. And if, there's, if you want something to change, or you want there to be a standard around it, then you need to talk about it. But for now, let's focus on what we're looking at. Um, and 
as we got more people engaged, the the next step is for them to realize, well, how do we keep this? Because it's not, this isn't going to be hard and fast regulation where where it's going to be enforced by a policeman walking along at every single uh, and checking every single charging point. We know that doesn't happen. So the only way we can do this is the enforcement has to come from all of us. So people have to stay engaged all along. And we have to make sure that when we have asked for infrastructure or we see that infrastructure is going to be put in, that we get those, those organizations or those individuals who are looking at it to make sure they have considered this PAS, considered PAS 1899. Because as Catherine, um, Catherine Maris said earlier, retrofitting is slow, it's super expensive, and it often just won't happen. And the idea of taking a shortcut right at the beginning, because it feels easier, it only ever feels easier for a short amount of time. So the PAS, it's not exhaustive, and there's going to be lots of areas for innovation. And indeed, by using a standard, we encourage innovation. There's quite a lot of research out there to show that innovation is encouraged through standards as organizations can see how they can get involved. Um, but the important thing for us has been seeing that people are really engaged and want to be engaged and want to be interested to help this move forward. I'm going to stop there. Um, hopefully, I've kept time. Um, uh, but yes, I'm looking forward to it as an EV user. I'm looking forward to how um, more disabled people, their families, friends, carers, but importantly, everyone, just every EV user will be able to uh, use this PaaS to uh, improve their experience of being an EV user. Thanks, Matt. That was fantastic. And yes, I, I can remember London in the 80s, unfortunately. <laughs> that was, it was really insightful. And, and actually, I think you've made a really interesting point about the fact that vehicles are, are getting bigger and the infrastructure hasn't grown with them. And we've, we've probably all, yeah, as you say, crammed, tried to squeeze our car into a supermarket space. Um, increasingly hard to get out of a car um, as they get bigger and bigger. Um, we, we'll open out for a Q&A now. So I'll ask our other speakers to turn on, on their cameras and join, join Matt. It, thank you, everyone. Well, one question I'm, I'm keen to, to kick off with, and Catherine and Designability have touched on this. Um, but Matt, I'm just interested in your, your thoughts initially. Um, won't let you pause for breath. I'll <laughs> go to you straight away, Matt. Um, just in terms of you know, some of the failings with the current EV charging infrastructure in terms of accessibility, um, were, were there particular failings that you would pull out now that are you know, have been particularly um, kind of pertinent to developing the standard? Well, uh, it's it's quite difficult to pick out individual one, but uh, we could start with the space. Um, we will cover that. Just that clear, is there space between the vehicles? And again, it's very easy to, to look at it and say, well, not everyone's in a wheelchair. Yeah, no, not everyone is in a wheelchair. But how much space do you actually need for a wheelchair compared to someone with a pushchair? Or someone who's carrying bags or someone who's walking with sticks or actually just to prevent someone from scratching both your vehicle and the vehicle next next to you if they're walking through um, when you add in a cable sticking out if it's if it's sticking out from the side you're going to lose what another another foot maybe more so um so that space is is a key part um the problem of course that you, we then have is not everywhere uh, not every vehicle charges from the same point at least we know that with the majority of um, petrol vehicles it is in the rear quarter on the left or on the right so we can have a good feeling of that that's not the case with with um with evs the, the charge points are, are are all over the place so that makes it a bit more difficult again but then the other thing which was really good to sit down and spend some time on was how we manipulate that um, charging cable. And those super fast chargers, which are fantastic as an EV user, that you can pull up and add in 200 miles in, in 20 or 30 minutes, they're really heavy. They're heavy if you're, if you're not disabled. They are noticeable, if you, even if you're fit and strong, they are noticeable, just, in, just as a, 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 um, a petrol or diesel pump can be. 
Um, <clears throat> but the faster they are, the heavier they are. And actually, even if you're not disabled, that's quite a difficult thing to work around. But if you are disabled, um, so if, if you're in a chair, how do you move that chair and you hold this? Or um, if you don't have fingers, if you don't have grip, how do you do that? How are people doing it? What are the workarounds people have found? And part of that conversation comes back to, um, we can't get 100%. You can't ever get 100% in everything. It's just, it's not feasible. But what you can do is you can look to get 97%. And if you can get 97% using something really um, comfortably, then you, you free up a lot of resource to say, right, now we can look at how we can help that final 3%. Um, and th so those are the conversations I think that are particularly interesting. Thanks, Matt. And, and you touched on a, a point there around um, the, the charging inlets on the vehicles and whether you know, they're, they're not universally positioned at the moment. Um, and we've had a few questions coming into the chat just around the involvement um, in terms of vehicle developers, vehicle manufacturers in the standard. Is that something from the panelists feel as the standard starts to uh, to match point, as it starts to get used and we find out more about it. Do we see the potential for more engagement with vehicle manufacturers in these types of areas? Is anyone happy to kick off with that question? I'd like to talk to that one, if that's okay, Nick. Please do. Yeah, I'll, um, it, it's, it's, one of the, it's one of the challenges. Um, we have focused on the charging environment, um, which has included the vehicle and certainly um, the position of the socket on the vehicle is a challenge. Um, in an ideal scenario, when you're designing something, you have control over all parts of the system. Um, at the moment, we don't have control over the vehicle. We, we know that's causing issues. So um, yeah, and, and the example I give where that's been achieved is if you, if you have seen a Tesla supercharger and you've seen a Tesla um, they design that system, they design the parking space, they design the charger, they design where that charger was. Um, and so what they achieved there was um, the proximity between the socket on the vehicle and the charger was, um, they, they were very close, so a much shorter cable, which reduces the length. Um, so yeah, there's certainly some work to do. Um, and for, from what we're seeing with, with vehicles, I think initially um, with early EVs, um, the chargers went on the front because it was different um, and now I think now that they're they're becoming more like your standard vehicle that just happens to be electric um, there seems to be a tendency to put those where the fuel cap used to be um, our view from the work we've done is um, why not have two sockets on the vehicle um, which just allow more flexibility generally a socket on the side is useful for roadside parking um, whereas if you're in a um, in a a parking space, a socket at the front is is really useful. And just to give you an example of that, we've had people that we've worked with who have wanted to make the transition to an EV have realised that they can only they they want a vehicle with a front charger, and then their the, the choice they have in terms of which vehicles on the market that have a front charger available is limited. Um, and even one person that we worked with who was really excited about the project did some early work with us. Got, got his EV and then actually found out that having a rear charger um, meant that he wasn't able to charge his vehicle. So yeah, big challenge. Um, I, I, yeah, I think, I think yeah, N next step is to understand how we can influence the vehicle. And um, we've done the charging unit end, so how can we influence the vehicle? Thanks. Just to Thank you. build on what Claire was saying as well, I, I think it was completely right, but I think one of the great pro like things about undertaking the process of developing a PAS is you do get all this feedback. So anything that is potentially considered outside the scope of the PAS, so obviously the PAS itself is focused on accessible charging, but we did get a lot of comments through uh, public consultation from steering group members about the fact that there is no standardised position on a vehicle for where a charging socket should be, which does make the installation of charging infrastructure more difficult to, in terms of, as Claire said, reducing that cable length or reducing the forces required. But these have brought all these issues to the forefront, so it now provides a basis to take other issues forward that have been identified. And again, anything that was potentially considered outside the scope of the PAS, so for instance, uh, vehicle OEM uh, adjustments, they are now all highlighted with the likes of OZ, with motability, with designability, with everyone involved in the overall process. So it's something that we can identify what issues that there are going forward and then work with people and work with relevant parties to assist with solving those issues. 
Thank you, Peter. One, one stakeholder that engaged um, engaged actively in the in the process of developing the PAS with, with charge point manufacturers. And there's a few questions just around uh, coming in on the chat around the involvement of charge point manufacturers and how committed they are to uh, you know designing to the PAS. I don't know, Catherine Maris, are you, are you able to pick this up initially? Yeah, sure. Happy to pick up initially. I think with all things, um, there's a range. We've had some very committed charge point manufacturers who've made it clear it's their intention um, to kind of take up the PAS, which is, of course, involuntary. And that's really fantastic to see. Um, they've been feeding into the standard. They've been feeding into designability's work. Um, they provided that really expert view on what they think is achievable um, and, and also been very honest when, when they think there's things that aren't. Um, and then we have some people have been a little bit more disconnected or people have kind of um, pushed back, I think, particularly on the point around, around you know, the, this view that do we really need to design for this group of people? Um, and that's really sad and unfortunate, but we're just going to have to keep um, raising awareness and, and keep pushing. Um, and I think from what Kira said, we, we were surprised actually about the level of engagement and buy-in. And so I would say this is very new industry EVs and everyone's in it a, a lot of times for the right reasons. Um, it's not just about commercial profit, it's people who want to make the planet a better place. So I think on the whole, we've actually had a lot of positive engagement, a lot of people who want to do the right thing. So that's been hugely encouraging. I would just, Brand, did you want yes. to comment on that? Thanks, Nick. Yes, I would just add uh, that as well as all those good things that Catherine Maris just said, uh, it also makes good business sense. Um, because there's millions of disabled drivers who will have to transition to electric vehicles in 2030. So why, as a charge point manufacturer, would you want to exclude millions of consumers? So it's the right thing to do, but it's also the makes business sense as well. A, a number of the questions we've received are around the role that local authorities are going to play in, in championing the use of the standard. Um, uh, not not only um, you know where, I guess to an extent how how they will hold suppliers accountable or encourage encourage suppliers to follow the standards. Um, so yeah, I welcome the thoughts of anyone on the, on the panel on, to that point. I think I'll, I'll start off with this one. Um, so as as, you know, as as everyone said, the, the PAS is voluntary in uptake, but as government we want to see. Um, we want to see good uptake of, of the PADS and we want to see good progress in this area. Um, you know, we, we hope this will be a good tool for local authorities to inform their decision making and their planning. Um, and in, in terms of the, the central government role uh, in the future, um, we will be monitoring the, the scale and the uptake of, of the PADS um, to, uh, you know, to, to inform our decisions on, on regulation in the future. Yeah, what I would add to that, and. Uh... Uh, in addition to what Seb said is there's been some exciting examples already actually of some local authorities that have started to put this um, into practice. So they won't have had the finalized standard until today, but I know High Trans, for example, which is kind of, um, I think three um, local authorities, um, they kind of came together as a group and they were procuring, they held a workshop around accessibility. They asked, um, you know, uh, bidding providers a few questions about accessibility based on what they knew about the draft standard. And so I'd say it's really exciting to see that there are local authorities who are really on the front foot and kind of see that they can improve the experience for, for, for people in their area um, if they were thinking about accessibility. Um, I'd also point people towards UK Power Network's um, Enable project, um, which worked with a lot of local authorities um, in relation to on-street charging infrastructure and how the local authority, um, the DNO, which in this case was UKPN, um, kind of worked together to think about um, electrification of, of blue badge parking bays, for example, and, and kind of mapping where accessible charging infrastructure um, should be based on the disabled population in the area. So again, I think there's some innovative work going on and now it's kind of, um, now that we have a finalized standard, let's see um, where we get to on, on kind of more comprehensive implementation. The, re the reality is um, industry follows one thing and that's what the market say they want and what the market push for and use so if um uh, and and i and i do think having uh, having worked on, on quite a few um bits of regulation in the past that um <clears throat> which are you know are, are different standards but I, I do think uh this standard goes a long way to, to enabling industry to actually set set a ball uh, a starting point and go okay fine so this is what is this what you're saying is acceptable or is this what you're saying is a gold standard? And actually, we don't think this is a gold standard. We think this is 
what you need. This is going to be the basic minimum. Uh, and that's going to become more and more obvious to them. Uh, um, but it does, as I, as I said earlier, it, it will require people to keep talking about it. It will require people to say, oh, I see you're starting to make these and you're marking out these bays. Uh, can I just ask why they're only you know, two meters wide? Or where where are people going to go? Where are because not everyone understands um, even EVs who are, who are building things, these things. Never mind um, disability needs. And I think getting people to understand or even just know about um, sta the standards and that this is out there is going to be a really important part. And there's a, there's a question in here uh, following up, following on from local authorities around just landowners private landowners, landlords, um, an interesting question around how do we, uh, you know, how do we overcome some of those issues where perhaps the charge point operator and designer um, isn't perhaps in control of, of some of that? Um, is the path yeah. something that can be used to leverage those types of discussions with landlords and landowners around uh, the space needed for charge points? Yeah, I absolutely think so. So we've done some kind of previous work. Um, we had charge point providers come to us and say, look, we really want to make our infrastructure accessible, but um, the site owner, the landowner, or the council we're working with um, isn't listening um, to us. What can we do? And, you know, we put together kind of high level one pages around kind of making the case for accessible charging. We've offered to come and present and try and help make that case around why accessible charging is important. So I think the PAS absolutely is a document that um, a, a charge point provider might be able to bring along and say, look, um, you know, this is the PAS, this is what um, uh, accessibility is uh, supposed to look like, and um, this is um, being considered at a minimum, it can be applied to, to all charge points, um, it's voluntary, but this is really the way the market's moving, um, as, as Matt said. Um, and actually the onus is on you, the procurer, so um, you can commission me to not have accessible charge points, but then, you know, later on um, when, when people use it and, um, and, and have issues, you know, that's going to it's gonna be on you, right? So I think absolutely um, uh, the PAS can be used um, in that way because we put in all this hard work, um, you know, this, this excellent steering group of experts to define what accessible charging means um, and, and, and that's ultimately the way we want it to be used. I think just to build on that as well, like I'm coming back to the point on charge point operator uh, appetite to improve accessibility for charging infrastructure. What I have found is that a lot of charging operators are willing to, uh, they, they actively want to uh, implement accessibility, but before now they didn't have that definition of what accessibility looked like for public charge points. So as Catherine said, this is kind of the first step in saying this is what we mean when we say accessibility, public charge points, and then that also assists other stakeholders involved in the process, such as landowners and landlords. Peter, just a quick, uh, a, 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 you, your presentation very helpfully talked to us, walked us through the, the standard at a high level. A couple of the questions we've got are around the, the content of the standard. Um, one mentions clause five and, and describes that the, the diagram indicates a male in the wheelchair, for instance, and, but, but also the question is around essentially does the standard take into consideration other heights, weights uh, for women, um, other people uh, in, in wheelchairs or el elderly people. Um, and so it, interested in your thoughts there. And also, um, does standard take into consideration um, CHAdeMO uh, connectors that typically have the kind of larger release mechanism? I don't know if you're able to field it, either of those, Peter. Yeah, sure. For the component heights, I will hand over to designability in a second just to flesh that out a little bit more. But the research that designability undertook was with, again, with people with different, that experience different disabilities. So it wasn't just one uh, specific set. It was, again, it was people that experienced different dis disabilities of different genders, etc. So yes, that was factored into the designs and the, the height limits that we came up with were, or that designability came up with were uh, based on that overall user testing. Um, for the forces, that was a particular focus area that we looked at quite closely. Um, so the connection forces for charge point connectors. Uh, there are existing standards out there that specify a maximum of 100 Newton force to connect a charge point connector. But the user testing that was undertaken was found that that cannot be considered accessible. So what we have, what we can't obviously ignore the fact that these testing methods already exist for existing forces. But the uh, the forces that we came up with for that we landed up for the uh, connections were for 60 newtons. But we acknowledge that some forces may be above that. But where they are above that, there should be uh, additional assistance being looked at for those sort of larger 
uh, charge points which are more likely to be located in service areas where there might be existing uh, additional assistance available already. Um, for the charge point component, hides, I'll hand over to Kieran and Catherine just in case you want to uh, develop anything you just said there. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, so um, just on the charge point component heights, and it's also worth mentioning um, another member of the steering group who've done some work in this area, um, which was great. So when we came together, it was good to compare notes and see that actually um, the, the, the findings were almost identical, and that's the Actors Association. Um, I'm sure there's some people here today, so um, thanks to those guys. Um, so yeah, we, in, in our testing um, with the fast charge unit we developed, um, looked at how we could come up with a kind of, um, a sort of narrow range of dimensions that would allow tall people um, to be able to just kind of reach down um, without bending, um, but also seated users to be able to access, um, and not just to be seated and to be reaching up, but those who may not be able to lift their arms very high, um, to have, so um, being able to access and, and, and plug in a connector um, with kind of the elbows on your lap. Um, so uh, I guess the ideal scenario is that you'd have a range of charges with sockets at different heights, but there's obviously a, an implementation challenge to that. Um, so yeah, you'll see in the standard, there's a, a fairly narrow range um, and it, it, it shows actually how doing that live research and development um, specifically for EV charging was really useful. Because prior to that, we were using something from ticket machines um, in terms of um, height range, which was a very big range. Uh, and the top of that range was almost inaccessible for seated users. Um, so the way that you're using a product, not just can you reach it, um, but for example, there's a difference between reaching up and touching something and having to hold a cable which has some weight to it, line it up and insert it. Um, so that just demonstrates how doing that kind of live research with um, you know, with the product that you're going to be using um, is really important. So those dimensions were narrowed down. Uh, just in terms of connectors, yeah, we've, um, with our prototypes, we based it on um, CCS type two, um, because obviously there's a shift towards that um, in the UK and in Europe. Um, but the principles of design in terms of en enabling people with different strength and dexterity to be able to grip and use that connector um, applies to other types, for example, um, Chadamo. Um, but yeah, we've we, we we looked at CCS type two because that's that's where things are moving. Thanks, Keir. I think, um, Nick, the sorry. Other, sorry. Yeah, the, the other point that I would add is that um, is echoing something that Matt said earlier, um, that accessibility isn't a binary thing. You, it's, it's, you don't have something that is either accessible or not accessible. Different things are accessible to different people with different challenges, different conditions and different disabilities. Um, and obviously, uh, with, within this project, we spoke to a really wide range of people with different disabilities and different uh, challenges but we haven't necessarily spoken to everyone with every challenge. So um, just going back to the point that the, the questioner made, um, it, it, isn't, it isn't a black and white, it isn't a binary thing, but what this is, is significantly more accessible than anything else that's out there. So, so it may not include every single challenge that every single disabled person has got, um, but as Matt said, that, that, that's almost impossible to do. Uh, what this does is make significant step forwards uh, on accessibility across many different types of disabilities. Disabilities. Thank you, Catherine. Seb, but I don't want to let you off the hook too much. So um, I had a couple of quick questions for you before we wrap up. And understandably, uh, there's, there's quite a lot of questions around enforcement. Um, you know, how will uptake of the standard be monitored? How how will enforcement work? We've already talked about the fact that standards are, are voluntary, of course, but I don't know if there's anything you're able to say on that. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the, the standards are voluntary and as such, um, we would like to see the industry um, drive forward the, the uptake of, of PRES 1899. And, um, but certainly as a central government, we, we will be monitoring the, the, um, the scale of uptake and, and, and looking, you know, we'll be involved in this process of, uh, this kind of iterative process that, that, that PAS 899 will be because this isn't just a, a document that is being published now and, and, and left um, and, and not being developed further. So, um, it, you know, over the, uh, the next few years, we will be involved in, in, in monitoring how uh, how effective the, the uptake is, is, is being uh, taken. Um, and, you know, this will be something that we'll be um, 
you know, will be informing our policy thinking um, in the future. Um, and, and, you know, we will think about whether uh, this is something that, that needs regulating in the future as well. Um, so even though it's, it's voluntary at the moment, we, you know, as everyone everyone kind of seems to have alluded to previously, this is the direction that, that we are travelling in, and, and it's very important that industry um, does, you know, does take this seriously. Um, so yeah, I think uh, you know we'll, we'll we'll be staying involved in the in the, the process moving forward. Thank you, Seb. There's so many questions, and we're we're at time now. Um, Lots of questions around on street charging and how we make that more accessible. Um, and they, that may be that we can share our, our questions with some of the panelists and we can respond to some of those with a, with a kind of Q&A type uh, paper following the webinar. I think there's some really helpful questions in there. Um, I'd, I'd, li I'd like to, to thank all of all of our speakers. Um, really really insightful and, and thanks not only for joining today but for your contribution to the development of the PAS. Um, we've actually posted the link to the standard in the chat now, so you'll be able to download the PAS. Hopefully that will all work for you. Um, if not, you can find it on our website, um, where there's, there's, that's where we'll also put additional information around the standard. Um, but as I said, th thanks to all of our speakers and, and thanks to you for joining today. We're really pleased to have the numbers that we've had uh, taking part and um, Catherine Brown's point, you know, this is a, this is a bit of the start of the journey in some ways. And as we learn more about different needs and different users' needs, the standard can, and I'm sure it will evolve as we go forward. So, um, yeah, it would be it would be great to see it being used in practice, to learn from that experience, and and ensure the standard set stays relevant and fit for purpose uh, over the coming years. So, thanks again. Please. Um, uh, follow the, any of the web links there that are useful to you. We're running a session this afternoon, a separate webinar on automated vehicles um, and some of the challenges with deploying um, auto, automated vehicles safely on our roads. Um, and there's lots of other webinars that we're doing around the topic of transport um, that you can also find on our website. So we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, hope, hope you can successfully download the standard and uh, we look forward to your feedback on it. Thank you everyone, thanks for joining. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all.